is one past. Maybe we should give them just two minutes. So. I'll just see if people are on the way out. I think we're all set. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, and I'll just give it to you. Shall I just... Shall I just start? <laughs> I didn't know what I just meant. Yeah. <laughs> just I'm, just, oh, well, I'm going to do what I plan to do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, all right uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, we're extremely pleased to have Rob Fuse with us this afternoon, uh, who is uh, who's got an awful bunch of titles. I'm only going to name a few. He's a PhD on creative and critical writing. And he's currently a professor in artistic research and head of research at the Stockholm University of the Arts. Um, and has been senior professor of research design at St. Lucas in Brussels. Uh, has also been working with design theory and practice, uh, practice based research at Kunstfak in Stockholm. Uh, and a few more things to do with architecture and design. But I will leave it to Rolf to introduce himself and. Uh, so you can start talking about writing about architecture. Welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation here uh, to <clears throat> Tina, Nonna, and Klaus. It's, I'm very, uh, this is my first time at Aarhus, first time at the Ar Architecture School as well, and I'm really uh, delighted to be here. I think it's very exciting what you're working with here. So thanks for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> I'm... Uh, <clears throat> Um, I was planning to give a talk with no pictures. What I normally do is just show pictures, don't write anything, and just talk around the pictures when I give lectures because it's a little bit more interesting and interactive that way. But this time I thought I'd take writing seriously and actually write something, which I've, I'm a little bit out of practice with, but uh, <clears throat> I thought it'd be interesting to see uh, you know, what one could do, explore writing through writing. And... Um, <clears throat> Right until about an hour ago, I had no pictures, and then I felt a little bit sorry for you, so I thought, I'll get the pictures out of the way at the beginning, and then we get back into uh, writing. So, <clears throat> a large part of this lecture, and usually for me, will be read. It's written. And um, I just want to start by saying, what, whilst I, I come from a literature background myself, I, I did a, a PhD in creative and critical writing, which basically meant I wrote a novel for the PhD about an imaginary city, which I think is the beginning of my connect connecting to uh, architecture without realizing it. Um, since then, I've been working more in architecture and then in art, craft, and design at CONSFAC, uh, artistic research at Vetenskapsrådet, the Swedish Research Council. And now <clears throat> I'm at, uh, for the last year, since the last year, I've been at the Stockholm University of the Arts, which is a new university, a merger between the schools of opera, dance, circus, film, theatre and media, uh, all to create an exciting new university to develop artistic research. So the red thread that runs through my wanderings, my nomadic <laughs> wanderings through disciplines, is really this idea of um, artistic research, and more specifically... Um, <clears throat> The idea of giving an account, and I think this is what connects to your interests on the course and thinking as architects about your relationship to giving an account of your practice. Um, 
staging an encounter is how I sometimes talk about it. Um, and what I, I'll give you the sort of summary here. What I would like you to consider is writing in all its diversity, its multiple forms. I'm very interested in hybrid forms. That's why I'm a prose poet, because that's where you can bring in different reference systems and combine different discursive uh, conventions. So I like this hybridity in writing. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to invite you to consider the when of writing, because often people think of writing in terms of writing up. You know, you do, you have your process, your design process, and then you write it up after the event. It's like a, almost like a police report when you've witnessed an, a, a car, car crash or something. Uh, and that, so I'd like you to think about uh, writing as a model-making activity. It's good we just had lunch, so I got <laughs> had these ideas over lunch. Um, a model-making activity, that is to say, you're all, we're all engaged in different forms of prototyping. As architects, you are prototyping all the time. You're creating models. And what do models do? They allow a conversation. They allow you to anticipate a future scenario. You know, so a model is a device for facilitating conversation. Maybe I don't need this. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a device for facilitating conversation. It allows you to predict the future. If you read a menu outside a restaurant, you think, aha, so if I do this, this, and this, then these actions will unfold, and eventually there'll be this delicious seafood, seafood in front of me. Um, so think about writing also as a model-making activity. That means if you introduce it earlier in the design process, not at the end of the design process, writing up, but, but write as, at the beginning or as a continual part of the design process, it allows you to think about your thinking. It allows you to look at your looking. It allows you to think against yourself. It allows you to work on lots of different scales. You, know, you can observe a phenomenon from out of space or from very close up. You can shrink yourself as the narrator into being sort of ant size or into being a giant. You can do things with gravity that you wouldn't be able to do in, uh, in uh, real life. And you can also create models that would be prohibitively expensive in real life. So all these things you can do in writing is a very enabling device. It's a, it's a technology, it's a model making activity, and um, <clears throat> that's just a way of tuning in to say, this is how I'd like you to think about writing as we go forward. <clears throat> Um, I have, uh, I seem to be, I have this sort of double relationship to writing because on the one side it's my core, it's my, if you like, my artistic practice, it's part of my professional practice and at the same time I seem to be constantly running away from it and finding it around the corner. <laughs> it's always there waiting, no matter which side street I dash down trying to escape it. So more recently I've been thinking of this sort of a uh, larger notion of writing, um, metaphorically speaking, in terms of exposition. Exposition is the term that's used in the Journal for Artistic Research, which is an online journal you can access for free. And it's on the research catalogue that's connected to it. And exposition is the idea of uh, what I call staging encounters with the work. Um, <clears throat> it's the notion of there's the strategy that you decide upon to bring an audience, to give an audience access to your work. So there's the work, there's the reader or the audience, and there's yourself that is in charge of staging that encounter. An exposition is a term that's used for that. Um, enjoy the image, because this is the last architectural image you'll see, I think, so it's about to go. <laughs> uh, so... Exposition writing, I think, it also comes into this picture, which is one creature saying to another, good work, but I think we need just a little more detail right here. And it, this is also, I think, part of the uh, challenge in terms of writing. It's, we can devise all sorts of impressive systems, but often when you talk to designers and artists and architects, they talk about things like intuitive, you know, working intuitively. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was pursuing unknowing. And that's that space where it's written, then a miracle occurs. So the challenge then is how do we devise appropriate and expressive accounts or encounters with that space in which the miracle is occurring? 
such that we don't reduce the complexity of the work. We don't turn it into a banal theorization, but we unfold, it's a popular term with architects I know, we unfold <laughs> or we, uh, we allow it to speak on its own terms, the work to speak on its own terms. So two key words there, appropriate and expressive. How do we devise an appropriate encounter and one that is, that is expressive of the complexity of the work? And um, sometimes I'll see if this internet works. Oops. No. It doesn't matter. It's, uh, you can catch this on YouTube. It's a picture of a, it's a short film of a hand repeatedly trying to ca ca catch a sheet of lead falling. You may, maybe you've seen it already. It's, a very, uh, it's quite popular in architecture schools, I think. Um, and you see in the process the lead is starting to transmit its material properties to the hand. And so when you look at a film like that, you can say, how might we talk about this? You could say, let the hand be practice and let the lead be theory. And then you have a one type of conversation where practice is continually trying to grasp theory and most of the time failing to do so. That type of conversation you can unpack in various ways, or you can flip it over and do it the other way around and say, let the hand be theory and let the lead be practice. And so then you have theory trying to grasp practice and usually failing to do so and getting dirty in the process, but uh, sometimes succeeding. And it's not that one interpretation is better than the other, it's both are made possible by the work. So it's, it's we're, that also reminds us that we're dealing partly with preferences. This is all just before I start, a sort of way of tuning in to a way of thinking, I think. So exposition um, is an entire, entirely other topic, but I just wanted to give you a, a quick <laughs> glimpse of some of the things involved in it. I don't know if you can, it's quite hard for me to read on the screen. If you can see, but, um, um, I've published a chapter on this in a recent book called Exposition in Artistic Research, and I, I will happily share it with you if you'd like it as a PDF, I can pass that on. But this is basically the chapter in, in one picture. Uh, so exposition is this notion, historically, it's the notion of putting out of place, I can't read this myself, I'll do it from memory, putting out of Think, what, what is that all about? That's about taking the body out. It's about taking away the specifics of 
of uh, biological embodiment, you know, so you er eradicate things like gender, uh, race, class, sexuality, all these considerations which go to make up people being people and individuals are eliminated under this sort of, uh, this illusion of objectivity or this better construction of objectivity. And of course, the deconstructive uh, philosophies of the 20th century, such as um, feminism and post-colonialism, amongst others, uh, queer theory and so on, they have exposed that this ob so-called objectivity tends to be about the construction of a worldview, usually to do with pale, stale male viewpoints. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> Uh, of a certain age. <laughs> I'll get my coat. <laughs> um, so so that, that notion of objectivity has been uh, taken apart. And then, um, and then more recently you have, uh, with things like artistic research, you have these sort of negotiations of these conventions th through things like uh, multiplicity of voices, diverse forms of presentation, and so on. So this hard uh, sort of form, I mean, of course it's still there, you still have conventions. If you want to get your paper published through an academic or so-called scientific uh, journal, you need to still follow these sort of conventions. But through things like artistic research, there has been a renegotiation of what is an appropriate expositional form, which includes, and here's where it becomes relevant to you, consideration about um, uh, what writing strategies might I appropriately deploy? So the first PhD that I co-supervised was written, it was about 18th century landscape gardening. It was written by Katia Grillner, you might know, it's from KTH, School of Architecture. And she wrote it in the form of a, a dialogue between two 18th century landscape garden theorists, male, talking with a 20th century young female researcher. So she spanned time. And what I was quite proud of with that work is that there were no pictures in it. It's an, arch it's an architectural dissertation without a single image. Um, so it all worked through this sort of spatialization of the discourse using the form of the philosophical dialogue. And um, <clears throat> I'll just briefly mention this because this can also be um, useful, I think. Uh, and this is, again, thinking in terms of conventions. When I was asked many times by master's students, you know, how do I write up my work? Well, you know, as well as doing my work, I need to write it up. So, and then the, the answer is there's lots of ways of doing that. But there are certain like, conventions or certain patterns that you might want to use to accelerate that process. And they typically involve things like this. And that's also what research applications typically ask you to do if you make a research application. You're typically asked to say, how does this research proposal relate to research that's already been done or the work of practitioners that already exists? So the past, what, are, what is the landscape of uh, influences, if you like? The present, what are you planning to do? How will it unfold? With what method? With what resources, etc.? And then the future, which is what work, what future research will be made possible by my uh, project once you have funded it. So past, present, and future again. And it can be a good way of thinking about your work because you're, you are not working in isolation. You are always part of a community of practitioners. And it's for, for you to decide you know, the boundaries of that, um, that logic. <clears throat> Um, what are the boundaries of my practice? That's another interesting question to ask oneself. 
If you say, I am a X, I'm always interested with architects because you go on a table and say, everyone says, I'm an architect and I'm working with, and they give totally different answers to what they're working with. But they always preface it by saying, I'm an architect. <laughs> like this very shape-changing discipline needs to be rooted in this strong uh, professional identity of declaring, I am this, I am X. So what are the boundaries that you put around that sort of question, being an architect? Right, that's the end of the images and that's the end of the introduction. And now we, uh, now we, now we go into the, the writing stuff. <laughs> so I'll start with a couple of quotations. <clears throat> Describe the aroma of coffee. Why can't it be done? Do we lack the words? And for what are words lacking? But how do we get the idea that such a description must after all be possible? Have you ever felt the lack of such a description? Have you tried to describe the aroma and not succeeded? And then J.H. Plin, the whole thing, it is the difficult matter to shrink the confines down. What interests me about the Wittgenstein quote is uh, he's pointing to the limits of language in a way. That, in other words, he's pointing to a form of knowledge which we would call sensory knowledge. We all know what coffee is, you can all identify it, um, and yet, if you try to describe it, it's a very interesting exercise to try to describe it, it's, it's virtually impossible, or it is impossible to do it in an in a, in a, uh, entirely satisfactory way. That's why we have things like poetry, but even poets can't describe coffee accurately. So why is it difficult to write about or speak about architecture? Well, you could say, in fact, it's not so difficult um, to talk about architecture or to write about it because journalists, writers, critics, historians, philosophers routinely do it with various degrees of success or insight. And so do shoppers, entrepreneurs, commuters, sports fans, cleaners, and revolutionaries. The question presupposes the word meaningfully or perhaps appropriately, but appropriate or meaningful for whom? Yes, the question might rather be, for whom is it difficult to write about architecture and do so satisfactorily? But who exactly can't get no satisfaction by the, way we variously to, the, by the way we variously talk about architecture? The answer seems to be architects. Developing the capacity for critical self-reflexivity does not seem to be a high priority in a lot of architectural education. Yet architectural practice can be compared to language in one significant sense. Both develop by being strengthened from within and, as I'll argue in this talk, by being threatened from without. Architectural education might therefore prioritize the identification and expulsion of comfort, comfort zones from its practitioners. So first of all, you identify and then you rid yourself of these habits, these comfort zones. To speak of architecture through theoretical filters such as aesthetics, use, materials, politics, context, authorship, means to use language less concerned with the thing itself than with legitimizing and reinforcing a discursive authority. Critically reflective practitioners, on the other hand, in the pursuit of advantage in their own practice, may be drawn to perspectives that are dangerous to their own worldview. They may, they may actively seek to endanger a given professional language by testing what works and what does not, changing the language by introducing threats, contradictions, paradoxes, etc., and thereby strengthening their language, making it more conceptually agile while yet resistant to threats from both within and without their community of practice. This type of strengthening has little to do with the world as it appears to professional commentators of a given professional tribe, and everything to do with the expression of individual artistic preferences to ensure greater creative and intellectual agility. This implies a collision with the measurement systems that prize juries, universities, PhD panels, journal editors, grant-giving bodies, and the like, tend to favor. What determines on our behalf whether we are speaking appropriately about a field such as architecture? What is the quality of the engagement? 
Practitioners find quality in the capacity of a given tool or method to illuminate and multiply its own distinctive advantages, a capacity tested through the strength of our engagement with the tool or method itself. Can we, architects or non-architects, decide in a joint advantage in this respect? How might we engage those outside a community of practice in the expression of mutual preferences? How might we forge a mutual language with, which respects the demands for precision while yet acknowledging the vagaries and contradictions of human experience? If we decide to work together in a certain way, typically we agree to use certain terms, tools, languages, and so forth to produce certain effects that allow us to improve our practice, our way of being in the world, our way of cooperating with others. Rather than deploying language to assert a claim to authority, we seek to create the best possible conditions for understanding, thence improvement. Reflection is important, but is not enough. Reflection creates a shadow that makes us aware of the existence of the shadow. What we need is a device, a vessel to transport us outside ourselves. Language is that which intervenes between sun and shadow, the device. Our words, their relationship to our materials, methods and values represent an attempt to narrow this distance. Why then should it be difficult for architects to speak or write about architecture? Is it Cordelia's famous silence before her father's catastrophic question, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most, it's King Lear in the play of the same name, <clears throat> which of you three daughters, shall we say, doth love us most? And the first two daughters reply in competitive terms, trying to get a bigger piece of their inheritance. And Cordelia, as you know, stays silent. She refuses the terms of the question. And in doing so, she crashes the system. You know, she, she sets into motion all, the, all the, uh, um, the program that will lead to suffering, tragedy, and finally uh, a sort of form of understanding. <clears throat> Is an appropriate language lacking, in other words? Love and be silent i.e. a loving father should just know how much his loving daughter loves him, just as a building should somehow speak for itself, and in doing so, know how much love it inspires. Is it, in short, a description problem? And I should have mentioned at the beginning that I'm, I'm structuring this talk around four variations. So variation number one is the description problem. The novelist Paul Auster writes about the importance of leaving room in his prose for the reader to inhabit it. There's a way in which a writer can do too much, overwhelming the reader with so many details that he, sick, he, no longer has any air to breathe. <clears throat> the principle is elaborated in, at greater length by Marco Stanley Fogg, the narrator of Paul Auster's Moon Palace, who describes the challenge of descri describing in terms that should remind commentators on architecture of the importance of both specificity and the unsaid, leaving room again, an interesting spatial expression in this context, leaving room inside the text. Fogg's job in the novel is to recap, is to, sorry, Fogg's job is to describe the world to his employer, a cantankerous blind man named Effing. How he sets about this and then improving on his results outlines effectively an apprenticeship in learning to describe the world, the writer's task, and it's therefore worth citing at length. <clears throat> so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going through this. <laughs> I doubt this is an eye test, so I doubt you can read it. <laughs> So this is the narrator, uh, Marco Stanley Fogg speaking. And remember, his task is to describe the city to his blind employer. In order to do what Effing asked, I had to learn how to keep myself separate from him. 
The essential thing was not to feel burdened by his commands, but to transform them into something I wanted to do for myself. There was nothing inherently wrong with the activity after all. If regarded in the proper way, the effort to describe things accurately was precisely the kind of discipline that could teach me what I most wanted to learn. Humility, patience, rigor. Instead of doing it merely to discharge an obligation, I began to consider it as a spiritual exercise, a process of training myself how to look at the world as if I were discovering it for the first time. What do you see? And if you see, how do you put it into words? The world enters us through our eyes, but we cannot make sense of it until it descends into our mouths. I began to appreciate how great that distance was, to understand how far a thing must travel in order to get from one place to the other. In actual time, it was no more than two or three inches. But considering how many accidents and losses could occur along the way, it might just as well have been a journey from the earth to the moon. My first attempts with effing were dismally vague, mere shadows flitting across a blurred background. I had seen these things before, I told myself. How could there be any difficulty in describing them? A fire hydrant, a taxi cab, a rush of steam pouring up from the pavement. They were deeply familiar to me and I felt I knew them by heart. But that did not take into account the mutability of those things, the way they changed according to the force and angle of the light the way their aspect would be altered by what was happening around them. A person walking by, a sudden gust of wind, an odd reflection. Everything was constantly in flux, and though two bricks and a wall might strongly resemble each other, they could never be construed as identical. More to the point, the same brick was never really the same. It was wearing out, imperceptibly crumbling under the effects of the atmosphere, the cold, the heat, the storms that attacked it, and eventually, if one could watch it over the course of centuries, it would no longer be there. All inanimate things were disintegrating. All living things were dying. My head would start to throb whenever I thought of this, imagining the furious and hectic motions of molecules, the unceasing explosions of matter, the collisions, the chaos boiling under the surface of all things. As Effing had warned me at our first meeting, take nothing for granted. From casual indifference, I passed through a stage of intense alarm. My descriptions became overly exact, desperately trying to capture every possible nuance of what I was seeing, jumbling up details in a mad scramble to leave nothing out. The words burst from my mouth like machine gun bullets, a staccato of rapid fire assault. Effing constantly had to tell me to slow down, complaining that he couldn't keep up with me. The problem was less in my delivery than in my general approach. I was piling too many words on top of each other, and rather than reveal the thing before us, they were, in fact, obscuring it, burying it under an avalanche of subtleties and geometric abstractions. The important thing to remember was that Effing was blind. My job was not to exhaust him with lengthy catalogues, but to help him see things for himself. And this, I think, is the crux of it in this next passage. In the end, the words didn't matter. Their task was to enable him to apprehend the objects as quickly as possible. And in order to do that, I had to make them disappear the moment they were pronounced. It took me weeks of hard work to simplify my sentences, to learn how to separate the extraneous from the essential. I discovered that the more air I left around a thing, the happier the results for that allowed Effing to do the crucial work on his own, to construct an image on the basis of a few hints, to feel his own mind traveling towards the thing I was describing for him. Disgusted by my early performances, I took to practicing when I was alone, lying in bed at night, for example, going around the objects in the room, seeing if I couldn't get any better at it. The harder I worked, the more serious I became about what I was doing. I no longer saw it as an aesthetic activity, but, a moral one, but as a moral one. And I began to be less irritated by Effing's criticisms, wondering if his impatience and dissatisfaction could not eventually serve some higher purpose. Um, I was a monk seeking illumination and Effing was my hair shirt, the whip I flayed myself with. I don't think there was any question that I improved, but that does not mean I was ever entirely satisfied with my efforts. The demands of words are too great for that. One meets with failure too often to exult in the occasional success. 
As time went on, Effing became more tolerant of my descriptions, but I can't say whether that meant they were really any closer to what he wanted. Perhaps he'd given up hope, or perhaps he was beginning to lose interest. It was difficult for me to know. In the end, it could be that he was simply getting used to me. So <clears throat> this strikes me as a very good uh, description of an apprenticeship in writing. You know, the, the, the anxiety, the, the desire to sort of pile on descriptions, uh, the concern about not being understood, and then the gradual realization that actually taking away, you know, strip, this is also a design principle, I think, and it certainly works in fiction writing, stripping away, taking out information uh, can produce effects of greater resonance. Um, so when you're talking about short stories in, in writing workshops, you typically say, you typically think about the balance that a writer chooses between the information that they reveal and the information that they withhold. And if you pack in too much information, the reader tends to feel passive, like it's being told, he or she is being told too much, there's no space for the imagination. And if you strip away too much, then it can become too enigmatic and too disorienting and puzzling and so on. So it's always an interesting question, that balance that is struck. But the, the, the main point to bear in mind there is this idea, which again comes from uh, Wittgenstein, which is this, how small a thought it takes to fill the world. How small a thought it takes to fill the world. And the reason for that is that your audience, your reader, will wrap their imaginations around any detail. You know this from architecture. It also applies to writing. So close observation builds new worlds and therefore the demand for the expert and resident use of language to describe these. This takes time, tenacity, diligence, and practice, as the quote from Paul Oster uh, communicates. The difficulty with architecture is that we're speaking of individual experiences. The same brick is never really the same. The city is experienced differently by one walking upright than by one in a wheelchair leaving aside the myriad other variations that influence our perceptions at any given time. The moment we try to generalize, two options appear. One, you can assume the voice of authorship with a capital A, but authors cannot be trusted. Two, or you can try to articulate the evidence of the senses, for example, the perception of light, acoustics, materiality, immateriality, as experience in space. In the latter case, we're in the realm of experiential knowledge, and the obvious challenges this involves when seeking to communicate its specific qualities to another experiencing individual. In order to experience beauty or love, it helps to be present in its act of unfolding. How do I describe the feeling of filling my lungs with a powerful sea wind? The description, evocatively or poorly delivered, will move me from engaging in an activity to thinking about that activity, effectively removing myself from the moment and putting myself into the past tense, into an, an account. Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, gives the example of counting cigarettes. For example, during a time of rationing, such as wartime, when my satisfaction for the day, week, or month might depend on the outcome. He claims that while I am counting the cigarettes, I'm not aware of my counting them, since the act of counting involves a pre-reflective consciousness that does not know itself as cogito. But if somebody, an officer, for example, arrives and demands to know what I'm doing, I would stand and salute and reply that I was counting, which means that I'm no longer counting. And this has been the PhD problem in architecture when we, in effect, stand before architects and demand that they give an account of what they're doing for the purposes of a PhD, and they stand and salute and reply, architecture, then this is the point at which architecture is no longer being done, but something else altogether. It is a difference between two forms of consciousness, and we, sh we should not underestimate the gulf between the two, as this is a key reason why it is difficult to speak about architecture. How do you convey to me the indescribable music you heard one warm, June, one warm June evening being played through an open apartment window while you sat waiting for me on a park bench in Brussels, such that I experience it 
as a musical experience and not as a well-crafted poetic description. There has to be a kind of speech beyond naming or even praise, a discipline that locates light and lets it go, from observer by Nate King, uh, sorry, Nate Clug. So variation two, light, the immaterial. I'm sitting in a dusty room on a sunny morning. I'm looking at light. We don't necessarily know what we are doing all the time but we trust in what we are doing to yield something we have not defined in advance. One sees the way the architect has cut a window in the wall from the way the sunlight hits the particles of dust. The immaterial becomes manifest. It is a church making manifest immaterial values goes with the territory. Then I was supposed to hold this. <laughs> Wrong order. There has to be a kind of speech beyond naming or even praise, a discipline that locates light and lets it go. So consider what happens when we sit in a dark auditorium and suddenly introduce a beam of light. I stand on the podium, inhaling the dark, Dust rising, subtle rustling. Under a tight spot, my fingers are interlaced, hands at rest. Light creeps into each crease, aging the skin. I am becoming the buster of film. My friendship with light began as a child discovering gardens, populated by shadows, ghosts, angels, grounded wings. Under each elm, a flickering wall of apparitions, insects on stilts, green blades, membranes radiant with translucence. Autumn leaves seize sunlight, a red and yellow lockdown. We come running, answering the call, kicking up a storm, gleaming, blood streaking the whites of our eyes. A hospital can never fully extinguish light. Before dawn, the lights creep back, blinking along the corridors. The simple beauty of a colour, Plotinus writes, is derived from a form that dominates the obscurity of matter and from the presence of an incorporeal light that is reason and idea. Put another way, for the past hundred years, the view from the bridge has been of tiny pockets of light on a continuous field of waves. Little wonder that some seek the stars and jump. And light seduces. It seduces because it reveals the contours of what in the world and what beyond we can touch. Spirit meets sensuality. Whatever we can press to our face to inhale and kiss is a material trace of the permission of light. In this way, light helps us see what we value. I look up. The shadows are still there. I press a key. Nothing. Then slowly, slowly, light slowly seeps across the hall, splitting the dark, illuminating where we are in relationship to each other, making present the space between us. It is time to open the mouth to speak. When I do so, the light whirlpools into my throat. This sudden disappearance is known in the trade as croaking. It is the negative space of this page in my hand. Little adaptation there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> or is perhaps the problem not of the mouth, but of the eye? Is it looking that is difficult? Not speaking or describing, but is it looking that's the difficult thing? Wittgenstein again. <clears throat> a simile that has been absorbed into the forms of our language produces a false appearance and this disquiets us. A picture held us captive, and we could not get outside it, for it lay in our language, and language seemed to repeat it to us inexorably. Is there then an observation problem? 
Variation number three. Observation problem. I cannot see what I have wrought because it remains too close, an extension of my thought that has not yet detached itself from my conceptual horizon. What I see is not the same as what those who use my architecture see, and it does not occur to me to ask them about their experience because I have allowed myself to become an author architect, which means I discount their experience because it is obvious to me that they lack a professional language and therefore they are not my peers. In this scenario, I become the author of my own solipsism. The same can be said for acoustics, what musicians called sound. Sound takes place in architectural space. We are locked in space. We are trapped by architecture. Perhaps this is why it is difficult to see it and then speak about it. The animal cannot speak of the device that has trapped it because as long as it is ensnared, the trap has become an extension of the creature's body. The unnamed prisoner in Kafka's In the Penal Colony does not look at the legal machinery that penetrates and then absorbs him. Variation four, and this is the final variation. <clears throat> being touched. Materials bring together all the senses. Say to an architect, this is an interior made of plain raw concrete and its, qu its qualities will be known. Stand in the space and say it again so the words reflect from the surroundings. This Beautiful interior is made of plain, raw concrete. Architects will know what this implies in regards lighting, acoustics, materiality. Materiality is the prime factor. It mediates all the other senses. My children are talking to their friends via Skype. One side of their conversations leaks down the wooden staircase or through the open kitchen door until here becomes simultaneously an extension of their various theirs. The dog knows how to speak about architecture by where it chooses to sleep away the hours. The house is a living instrument in which we shake, rattle and roll. You go through an arch and aren't the arch, just infinity of form, curves curve of becoming a phrase tracking it to future's Celadon relief. This is Brenda Hillman, a uh, work called Statueless Architecture. How then to articulate the distinctive details of architectural practice so that these become resonant, eliminating self-dramatizing mythologies of authorship while conveying the complexity of our human experience of architecture? what it is to be touched and more empowered, enlightened and enchanted by spatial design. What it is to be touched and more empowered, enlightened and enchanted by spatial design, rather than its inanimate, material, technological, stylistic qualities. What, in other words, would be a high quality conversation or text in this respect? Is there a language more authentic than others for capturing architectural experience? If so, what are its elisions and exclusions? Why, in short, is it difficult to write or to speak about architecture? And this is my concluding comments. <clears throat> Why is it difficult to, to write or speak about architecture? Because finally, it is an ethical question. It is about experience or intention, and these two rarely coincide. At one extreme, you can put it in terms of hospitality or hostility. 
the 12 year old trying to be invisible, silent and weightless, trying to obliterate herself while being smuggled in a freezing container truck across a national border. She has a totally different conception of space to the well-decorated architect rising slowly from the banquet table and sauntering through the applause to the, to the stage to receive yet another award. The one is an adopted child from Somalia, the other a white European male aged 65. The two experiences will not coincide. They do not configure. Give me a better quality of life. Give me a reputation if I do so. Material, immaterial, touch, being touched. The two experiences do not meet. Give me honor, give me honors. Matter speaks and does so movingly in other words. And that's the end of the talk. Uh, I do have a text that could be a response to that last part in other words, but it's up to you. You may be tired of hearing. Uh, it's, uh, I have one of my own pieces that is called An Architect's Testimony, which is an, an experiment, an attempt to think about doing architecture inside language, but it's uh, one and a half pages and it's maybe too much if you've been patient and kind enough to listen for the last uh, 45 minutes or so. So it's up to you. We can either open up for discussion now or we can have the text and then the discussion. Sorry? The text. <laughs> you, thumbs down or thumbs up. So no text is thumbs down, thumbs up is text. <laughs> That's kind of a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> I have to be brave to do that one. Okay, thank you. That's very nice of you to, to hang in there. Wow, okay. <laughs> what times it get dark in there, or who's... Okay, this is the conclusion, or this is, the, this is a postscript, an appendix, or a, a counter, um, counterweight, a counterpoint. It was, um, I was asked to report on activities at St. Lucas, where we have a, a, a practice-based PhD program for the architects there, and usually I write a nice, t polite, tidy essay. You know, it's published in a short book. But this time I thought, Instead of talking about writing, I'd try to do writing in such a way to see if it could be of, of interest as a sort of discussion point for architects. So this was my experiment to myself, to say. And originally I was this narrator I was going to be quite critical about, but I found myself sympathizing with this character. So that's also an interesting thing about writing is it makes you, um, you know, you change your view or you, this quality of empathy comes out that can sometimes surprise you. So, an architect's testimony. And it starts with a quote from W.B. Yeats. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths enwrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. W.B. Yeats, he wishes for the cloths of heaven. And the second quote, je ai un autre, which means I is an other, from Arthur Rimbaud, the French poet. Although, I am reliably informed that the inquiry has been formally terminated. I would like to end, yes, I understand, end my report to the ministry with some, let's say, more unguarded remarks, these being as follows. 
This then is a profession typically concerned with identity. I is an X. Identifying and validating members of its tribe through delineating the non-tribe, adding a spoonful of this, a pinch of that, in a bid to add musk to a broth that has been kept on the boil for centuries. Rarely do we acknowledge the full-blooded dimensions of its baffling untongedness. To do so would be to confront the what we thought were foundations of our what we thought were intellectual premises. We agree, I think, that the sulking prisoner exhibits a sorry lack of imagination. This is the reason I set out to test architecture by encasing your city in a web of my own devising, spun from a central frame, broad as an ocean bed, but threaded high into the airspace over the city, which was in turn patrolled by silent military drones delineating a virtual column, wherein the curtains of the theater of action would unfold, when, as needs must, the city would eventually come under siege from without. My web, therefore, had to be extremely fine-meshed, porous enough to permit engagement and pursuit in all its non-holonomic variety. This, as you know, was the first condition of the commission. But to call it a web is misleading, for the structure was neither a net nor even a creeping quasi-linear mesh of diaphanous threads. We deploy the terms and metaphors at hand and find ourselves thereby entangled in associations that increasingly bind us. Picture a silk stocking tossed from a helicopter. No, my architecture was not spun by nature's programming, nor was it an artificial network designed for a flow of information. To say that it was hung from an overarching beam is also misleading because this suggests some sort of veil is formed, a curtain creating a logic of barriers, of inside, outside, whereas what we added to this fine historical city was rather a form of game that would retain the traces of its being played out on the stone flags for millennia. You will say that it is sorry, you will say that it is not our job as designers to toy with people, nor to treat them as test subjects in experiments. And you would be right were people involved. You would be right were people involved. When swirling gales from the sea rearrange the fickle sand in the dunes, are people involved? When animals set out on their mournful treks across ancestral paths through the wilderness, or people even in the picture, how the jaw vomits forth metaphor, wipe it away. There is a temptation, a temptation to think of humanity, to think of humanity, to think of humanity as once having had some sort of intelligible shape and coherence, the eyes wipe them, of which our present population is merely the broken down remnant, gazing, no, grazing on the ruins it has inflicted on itself. Yet such melancholia, modish as it may still be in some universities and coffee franchises, does not stand up. It cannot walk, for it has no sense of direction and no retina rattling around in sockets to govern its desires and intentions. It is like a low hanging swamp gas, discernible and potentially deadly, but ultimately intangible as a turkey radiated by the storm. If you are truly a master of your fate, an engineer of will, wood, and can, you will walk straight through, your head would be held high, and you can look neither left nor right since such coordinates do not exist in the midst of gas. You wish to observe the effect of our work, to measure, evaluate, and judge what we have done. You claim to have eliminated bias from the expression of your preferences, and that your measurement systems and technologies of observation are accordingly up to this task. Your best officers are being recalled from slow dances on luxury liners in the belief that once debriefed, they are equipped 
to capture the essence of an idea. But my architecture is nothing if not nimble. Nowhere is there a finished or unbroken surface. My planes rise, rotate, disintegrate or fly according to their own physical laws. Report this at your peril. There is no decay. There is no entropy in this system. And as a result, your experience will only ever be partial rather than historical. If this aspect is somehow captured in your officer's reports, you will have taken the finest bureaucrats to have graced our corridors and created of them a generation of idle storytellers. Yes, there are garrets, cellars, stairways, lobbies, entrances, exits. How otherwise would your spies find their childish hiding places? But these can be made to disappear as easily as they were once summoned. Sometimes I have leant on a railing with the intention of striking up chit-chat, only to find the handrail melt beneath my hand and my legs suddenly knee-deep in slurry. Other times I have observed pond life teeming, then freezing, then fixed in perpetuity in aspic. We sack the museums only to see them reassemble on our streets. I add lighting, captions, utilities, vegetation, sewers, walls, walls on walls. I walled the desert until it became a compact mausoleum. It is an architect's dream to add form to the void. These are the last words and may perhaps be heard only by the mute janitor and her mop, no matter. We witnessed each other. That will suffice. That is my testimony. I have let go of so much. Now all that was relinquished is returning to eat me from within. I hear the snip snipping of its tiny teeth during the insomnia hours. Sentence after sentence devoured. I would have liked to somehow unfold and hold forth an expression of love. A clown's sodden bouquet, the bride's fleeting prize, flung from a suicide's bridge, the fish agape at the shapeless feast falling from the heavens, the fishbone retrieved from the mouth, the lips closing on fingertips. But that was never included in the original plan. Press harder. Press harder with a pencil until the paper mocks you no more. It is all there, the scent of rosemary on the grill, the spill of your laughter, the baby unfolding from its cocoon of sleep, wailing sirens, overhead fighters, castanet high heels, catcalls, choral practice, call to prayers, hot rod joyriders, the roar of the arena. It is all there and it's all within reach. Yet I cannot reach it. They say that you came here while I slept. I wish I had seen you a minute or two, hands clasped, Outside the mesh, I dreamed of having a cage made and advancing towards you, but everything I built was built around myself. It had neither entrance nor exit. If I try to leave, so to speak, try to speak, so to speak, try to draw your world before it thaws and retreats, I find myself encircled by walls. The janitor has gone, the dust returns, open the window. Let in the, if you will, people. Architecture takes guts, I learned. Guts on the sizzling grid. I ask myself, what happens to dreams? Can they die? Anything that dies surely once had some kind of aim in life, some purpose in being undead, conscious or not. So when they are finished, where do our dreams go? Are they drained, ironed out, stored in some underground freezer, compacted, shredded, or incinerated? Are they turned into postures, sorry, are they turned into posters with which to mock the young? The air is being let out day by day. The thread is returning to its spool. The eraser has molted on the empty page shut down, unplug, recycle. 
My architecture was always a form of laughter with no lungs behind it. When I find energy, I tell myself, it will be there, trampled by the feet of their children and their children's children, outlasting each generation, an eternal resurrection of its putative ruination. Increasingly, I forget the end of the line the moment I start at the beginning. Tread softly, the poet whispers, for you tread on my dreams. But he was wrong. It is my dreams that tread on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that's a, that was a long lecture, an unusual one. I haven't, like I said, I haven't read one for years and years. So uh, I hope it wasn't too deadening an experience, but uh, very welcome to make comments or ask questions or open up to a general discussion. If there's anything you'd like to go back and revisit, or if there's um, <clears throat> questions you have about your own work or the course or anything else. The word is free, as they say in Sweden. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. Thank you very much for your Thanks. It's really interesting to see the theme of Brooks on words and architecture. Uh, being a visual person, uh, it was very interesting. You said there were no pictures, but actually sitting here and listening to your voice and uh, at the same time being able to read the text hmm. gave me a possibility actually to scroll in your performance mm. and actually make it more understandable because English is not my natural mm. my first speech mm. and language. Uh, so, but it was quite interesting. Have you reflected on that position saying that, uh, actually declaring that there were no pictures today, but at the same time, mm. your text actually become, mm. uh, how to say, a sort of pictures mm. that gave me the possibility actually to to rethink how to say and to adapt your performance in another way. It gave me a space actually or mm. a picture to navigate in. Mm. How do you reflect in that position? Um, thanks very much. It's a really nice question and a really nice set of reflections. Um, <clears throat> um, for me, this was a new experience because, I, for example, that text I've never read aloud before. And it was quite, um, it was quite disturbing <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> I found myself quite, quite being affected by it in ways that I didn't expect. You know, also because I haven't looked at it for a long time. So, um, in that sense, it, it was. I found it. It was as I was reading. It was talking to me in ways that I found very distracting. <laughs> I just tried to keep going to the end, you know, because I found I was getting really distracted by some of the things it was throwing up. I guess. One of the things that sort of interests me in texts like that, because I mean, I, can, I do lots of different types of writing and sometimes very technical, very clear writing where you would understand what's being said. And then this type of writing, which is more opaque, which is del deliberately compacted and is also sort of eating itself. That is something I noticed, that the text is eating itself. So you introduce a term, you know, and, and the metaphor becomes literal. That's going on repeatedly in that text, you know. So. You say, you know, we can't stand for something, and then the standing is taken for the next sentence. It becomes a, a reflection about moving in space and, you know, everything about standing. So the metaphorical is constantly slipping into the literal and, and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> but I guess what I'm interested in that type of uh, writing is to sort of almost like make an object, to see if you can make an object. And it's not, and then there's, an, there's a related question, which is what do you do when you're confronted by a very dense text that is not easy to say, aha, it means this, or it's representing that, but instead you have to, I mean, you can get anxious, you can get bored, especially if English is your second or third language, it's a lot to ask to say, you know, stay with this. <laughs> or you can just relax and let go and just say, I'll listen to the music or listen to the rhythm or I'll see what pictures come up. And that's what interests me, that, that, because it's, it's, it's a different um, type of invitation you know, or encounter, perhaps, is the word. Um, so, for example, in, in one, of the, one of the courses that I've taught at CONSFAC, which is always very popular, is, is the idea of 
language plus material. So it's taking writing and thinking of it off the page, you know, so language in lights or space or jewelry or textiles or sound, you know, performance writing, writing in, as, and through performance of various sorts. And what's nice about that is that, that, is that language becomes, or the text becomes a, a thing, an object, a material, a material entity, you know, a sculpture. <laughs> Um, and it makes you also then reflect on this is not neutral, you know, this is not neutral. These are all technologies. The choice of font, everything else is all ways of staging a sort of encounter with text. So you can summarize this by, and this is another talk about <laughs> story, story, the basis of storytelling, but you can summarize it by saying you can look, you have really two traditions looking through and looking at, and the tradition of realism. Here's my prop. <laughs> Would say, you know, that language is to meaning as a, a glass of wine, red wine, which you can see here in my hand, uh, as a glass is to the wine, that you look through the glass at the fine, rich red of the wine, you know. And the glass itself is simply the vehicle, delivers the stuff to where it's going. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the other version of that is opacity, that you look at the surface, so then it would be a goblet, you know, and carved out of bronze or something with lots of dragons or whatever on the surface, and you're looking at the surface. And the same with language, you know, you can look, you can take forms like uh, detective fiction or maybe romance fiction, you are not really paying attention to the, the how of the telling, but you're, you're looking at the, the what of the telling, you know, what happens next. So language there is sort of supposed to be transparent. Or, the, or you can take someone like Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway or James Joyce's Ulysses, where the text is very compacted, or perhaps this one, the text is very dense, and so you're looking uh, at the text and not through the text. That's also one way of thinking about it. And then one final thought, and sorry to go on, but it's, it was a really interesting question. One, one final thought is um, this idea of ekphrasis. It's also a concept I've worked with quite a lot. Ekphrasis is from classical antiquity. It was uh, an exercise that young students had to work with as they learnt rhetoric. And it basically means the description, the art of describing an art object such that the description is more beautiful and compelling than the art object itself. So it, it disappears, you know. <laughs> You don't need the thing itself because you have the description. So you, you make you know, the description um, uh, the thing itself. And the famous example of this, which is another lecture, and which would be great to go through <laughs> another day, but uh, you can look it up in your own time, is the John Keats's amazing poem, uh, Ode to a Grecian Urn, in which he describes walking around this, this vase and describing these these happy lovers that are frozen in a moment of ecstasy, you know, pursuing each other, in a moment of youth and, you know, on the cusp of love and all the rest of it. And they're held in time and he slowly walks the reader around this vase and looks at it from these different perspectives. Very good for architects to think about this because it's also a spatial description. And of course you read this and think, wow, what amazing description. I must go to the British Museum and look at the original. I, I assume it's there because, you know, England tended to steal things from Greece, so it must be there. <laughs> Uh, and of course the joke is it doesn't exist, there, there is no vase, it's the, it's the poet's, the triumph of the poet, poetic imagination. So first of all he imagines this vase and then he describes it. And that's a really an uh, interesting example of ekphrasis, the triumph of ekphrasis, you know, which is why a lot of postmodern critics got interested in it because it's the, I always get this mixed up, it's the signifier triumphing over the signified. If you want that type of language, you can go that way as well. <laughs> yeah, but thanks for the question. Anyone else? Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. The, this text was written for an um, annual publication that comes out of the St. Lucas School of Architecture where you're supposed to reflect on the year. And instead, I, I sort of cheated for my last submission. I did this instead. <laughs>
Not me, the narrator does. That's the big, big difference. Yeah, that's, no, that's, uh, I take no responsibility for it. <laughs> PhD project in architecture that is also architecture. Yeah, could it be considered an architecture? Yeah, I have. Uh, I'm actually uh, co-advising a, a, a good example of that. I think it's um, <clears throat> who I think would be a really good person for you to invite <laughs> in the future. Sepida Karami. She's based at Umeå University, Iranian uh, architect who's also interested in exploring architecture and writing and language. That's why I was brought in. And she is, uh, she is making remarkable objects. They're sort of book-like objects, but they, they're architecture, you know, in, in card and paper and all sorts of materials inside which she, she takes a text and she explores, explore, for example, she's taken a, a sentence from Kafka and realized that the semicolon is right in the center. And on the one half of that semicolon, Kafka is, uh, is talking about um, love. It's an, It's a declaration of love. On the other half of the semicolon, he's talking about the impossibility of that love and death. So it's simultaneous that, you know, the declaration of love is simultaneously an embrace of death. It's typical Kafka, always making things impossible, <laughs> you know. And, and she's really interested, as am I, in, in, in a different way, in these impossible structures. So you could say, if we go back to my earlier comment, that text has been one model-making activity, you know, then you can say, what other how might you explore those sort of shapes and structures uh, in other, other materials, other forms, if language is, to, is just a material? And that's also something that I uh, would recommend you to think about. Um, you know, people tend to think of language as being connected to authority and authenticity and so on. But if you think about it as a material, it becomes quite interesting because then it's something, first of all, if you're writing in English, it's not such a problem because it's good that you're alienated from the language to, to begin with, if it's a second or third language. Um, and secondly, if it's material, you can, you can test the properties of the material by, by misusing it, you know, by twisting it and bending it, turning it inside out and exposing it to heat or <laughs> leaving it out in the cold overnight or, you know, all these sort of things you can, metaphorically speaking, do to language to try to stretch it and test its properties. Um, but can, I mean, the idea behind the practice-based PhD is that architecture uh, is the bulk of the work, and the, any sort of essay that goes with it is a supplement. Um, and of course, what's interesting there is that it's a sort of trade-off between the desires or the wishes of the practitioner and the constraints of the legal system <laughs> that says, you know, traditionally, PhDs involve these sort of apparatus. They have to be able to be disseminated, and they have to be able to be reproduced, and they have to be, what's the other one? Accessible across time and across space. So the PhD, my PhD can be accessed from somebody in Australia, and also by somebody in 10 years' time, so you can test it, in other words. With, with architecture as an as a instantiation of a PhD, um, the dissemination issue is going to involve translation because, you know, typically you'll document it in some way. And then it's also a question, it raises questions about that, um, you know, accessing in 10, 20, 50 years' time as well with certain temporary structures. But that's what the pressure of the, you know, artistic research and practice-based research is putting pressure on that. In other words, to say new models of uh, knowledge that are more suited to the specifics of practitioners. For example, I work a lot now with dancers as well and circus artists. And, you know, what is, what is the right form for them? It's, it's kind of boring if you have to say, write an essay, you know, write it up. <laughs> it's, it doesn't capture, or it, actually it can do in certain respects. But, um, you know, it's a very interesting challenge which is done differently by each person or by each group how they stage that encounter with the work in, in performance or...
Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's either or, I think it's more like a scale, you know, but it's like most scales, it's a tool of convenience rather than a tool of truth, you know, so you can look at certain things, I mean, um, certain texts are not supposed to draw attention to themselves, but you can still defamiliarize them. I mean, if you take, if you take a, a work of romance, or take uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, for example, I haven't read it. <laughs> I've opened it in a bookshop and thought, this is, a, this is unreadable. <laughs> it's so badly written. But you could also say that, that that relies, I suppose it relies upon producing a sort of immediacy of effect by not drawing attention to its literary construction. That's usually the case with erotic fiction. You know, you're supposed to be imagining the scene rather than paying attention to the writer's skill and craft and so on. Um, but if you, if you have somebody from another part of the world or from another, you know, uh, orientation or background, whatever, looking at that text, they would feel totally alien to it. So it's a contract that draws you into a, I mean, a text is always positioning its reader. It's always creating the reader and drawing you into this sort of contract. And you only have to think about um, a, a sign like you'll see in, uh, like I was just in London um, over New Year and pointed this out to my kids. It's a very funny sign that you see, dogs must be carried on the escalator. And, you know, you think, okay, in day-to-day -day life, you, you contextualize that. So you think, aha, that means if I have a dog and I'm going to this escalator, I have to carry it. That's a common sense interpretation. But there's nothing in that sentence that confirms that. It could be in a different discursive regime. It could be a claim to truth, you know. So dogs, as they go through life, at a certain point, must be carried on the escalator, otherwise they'll explode or, you know, be very, very sad or something, you know. Um, what else could you say about that? Dogs must be carried on the escalator. Well, there's other ways of reading it, I'm sure. I mean, the point is you locate it inside a, a sort of frame of reference to say this is an appropriate reading of that. And that's why it's interesting to misread things, <laughs> you know, to, to deliberately play with that and, and misjudge things. I mean, likewise, if I'm in a supermarket, you know, in the cornflake section of the supermarket and, and you sort of tiptoe up behind me and whisper, thou still unravished bride of quietness, you know, I probably think you're not talking about there being a sale on Weetabix, you know, <laughs> at this point, but it's a different type of, you know, we want to talk about John Keats or, you know, of a different type of conversation. So speech acts are constantly being put into frames. And the famous example is, um, is uh, this, what's his name? J.E.L. Austin, the language philosopher, who talks about uh, speech acts that actually produce effects, like saying, I do, if you're getting married, you know. I do, or I, th I thee wed, or with this act I marry you two. <laughs> And it's using language to produce a sort of uh, a, a, a real effect in the world, you know, in that case, a legal effect. Or likewise, you can take, and this is actually a nice exercise I do sometimes. You can ask people to close their eyes and to bring into your mind, we won't do it now because it takes a bit of meditation time to get into it, but to bring into your imagination the, the idea of a lemon you know, a bright yellow lemon, and then you just have to start thinking about it and thinking about its cool, knobbly surface, and you look at the skin and you think it's, you know, indentations on the skin, you think about its form and its density and so on. And then once you've got that very clearly in your mind and you've got your eyes closed, you're not distracted by anything else, then I say, and now take out a very sharp knife, you know, and slowly slice through the skin of that lemon and watch it come apart. 
And if you do that properly, rather than the way I just did it, if you do that properly, um, you then your next question is, what happened? And if it's done properly, people say, my mouth is filled with saliva. <laughs> And it's a, really, it's a really nice exercise because it's a, it shows you that something immaterial like language can produce physical effects. So it's powerful, you know, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Um, and, you know, if we contrast academic writing with its conventions of precision, um, supposedly neutrality, accountability, etc., with this use of language, um, what, it's tr what it's doing is bringing in the senses. It's bringing in experience, it's bringing in the senses, it's bringing in the body. And that is a very major distinction because the world enters us through our bodies. You know, and you know this as architects above all. You, know, you experience space through a sense of volume, through acoustics and light, etc. It's through your body. All the, you need all your senses for all those effects. So, the challenge then is how to register experience. Um, and that means that you're moving between different knowledge traditions. Um, so traditions which can be made explicit, like how to use the DVD recorder, you could say is propositional knowledge. You follow the rule book or the instruction manual. You know. Experiential knowledge or sensory knowledge, embodied knowledge, those sort of categories, they typically belong more to not to propositional where you can make things explicit, but more to uh, the idea of tacit knowledge, silent knowledge, or tist kunskap in Swedish. You know, in other words, knowledge which cannot be um, communicated except with a great loss of information. Good example is um, um, teaching a child to ride a bike. You know, you don't go, first you inflate the tires, <laughs> secondly you, <laughs> You know, you don't, you don't read a set of rules. You, you learn by doing it. Through you know, the child has to get balance into the body in order to understand through doing. Um, so, in that case, demonstration. And then um, the third one, third category, which also can be interesting to think about, is the idea of ineffable knowledge, which is knowledge which, by definition, cannot be communicated. And there, I had a, a little hint of that in the presentation when I spoke about, you know, what happens if we're to meet. In a, in a park in Aarhus on a June evening. It's a nice sunny June evening, the flies are buzzing in the air, you know, but I'm 20 minutes late, typical. Um, and you're sitting there waiting, and meanwhile, through a, the open window of a nearby apartment, it comes the most indescribably beautiful music you've heard. And then I come lumbering along, you know, and you say, what a shame you weren't here 20 minutes ago. You'd have missed the most incredible music. And I would say, oh, really? You know? What was it like? <laughs> Describe it. Give me the experience, which you can't do because it's ineffable knowledge. So you might say, if we both were trained in the history of music, and you know, you might say, well, it had certain baroque elements in it in the beginning, but it also used the uh, the, the canon tradition and blah, and that might locate it in terms of a history of music type conversation. Or if if we're both musicians, you might say. You know, well, it began with a augmented 13th and then it used a mixolydian scale to move to the E flat minor and blah. And then, you know, we might sit there going, yeah, <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> uh, but still, it wouldn't give me the experience of the, um, of the music itself. It, it's another way of sort of notating that experience. And that's the point, you know, that there are many factors. It may be that you are in love and so that that, that music particularly spoke to you at that moment or that you'd had a really good day or you just had a good meal or whatever you know all these factors can lead to the intensity of that aesthetic experience the the issue is the communicability or the incommunicability of such experiences and that's a really i think that's a really interesting challenge and particularly oh, i mean for architects as well as others Uh, in fact, I would say it's more than that. It's, an, it's a sort of, it's a central question for architects, uh, and it's also a central ethical question for architects because you can either say, "I'm an I'm an author architect," you know. And by that I mean, I'm a star. You know, I'm really good at what I do. I'm going to do my architecture and I'm going to put it into the world and win prizes, <laughs> and you'll admire it. I hope. Or you can say, "I will." 
I will talk to my clients, I will talk to the people that use my architecture, I, I will try to find feedback mechanisms. You know, I, I, I realize that what I'm putting into the world is actually part of a bigger system, so I need to be very um, <clears throat> tuned in to people's experience. And then you face this problem that I've just been talking about. You know, how do you access people's experience? How do you, how do you devise really appropriate, um, nuanced um, mechanisms of conversation? And I'd like to put out that idea as well, that conversation is a really powerful design material, design method. So how to design good conversations so that they you know, are empowering and enriching. Because some people, I was just in Norway and some people had this as part of their technique. Um, let's get rid of that. Oy. They would, um, they would say, um, Sorry, this is like hanging out my dirty washings. <laughs> the mess on my desktop. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. They would say um, uh, interviews, you know, but interviews are extremely boring and limited sort of exchange. And they kind of produce the results in many ways. Others might say a dinner party, and then it's getting more interesting because dinner party is, you know, is a different type of conversational model. But, um, yeah. That's a really nice question as well. Um, it's, uh, you know, I had, I had this uh, interesting conversation when I first arrived at the School of Architecture in Stockholm, when uh, one of the students said to me, you know, oh, you're really lucky as a writer. And I said, really? <laughs> Why is that? And she said, well, you know, you, 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 you know, you get an idea, you know what you think, and then you write it down. And, and I said, right. Uh, okay, and how do you work? And she says, well, I, I sketch, you know, and I sketch, and I sketch, and I sketch, and sketch, and sketch, and sketch. I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and then I start to see possibilities, and st I start to see a pattern emerge, and then I start to make decisions, and then I, you know, over time, this shape, this uh, design emerges from this sketching process. And I said, that's a really nice description, and it's an exact description of how I go about writing as well. <laughs> the sort of sketching process where you, you find out. Um, and you're also sort of wrestling with language as well. It's, 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 a, it's a really interesting exercise, actually. Take a blank sheet of paper, do nothing for a while, and then write an opening line, and then step back and, set and think about what that is implying, where that's directing you, that opening line. Because so far you haven't made any more decisions. But it's, again, this idea that you know, how small a thought it takes to fill the world. Because once you put a sentence down, straight away it's putting all sorts of assumptions on you. And that's why I talk about wrestling with language, you know, because it's saying, all right, now you've got to be, you know, consistent, you've got to be coherent, you've got to explain, you've got to follow this through, and, you know, you, have, you need to have narrative, you need to have sequences. And you can go against that and say, no, I'm going to use juxtaposition instead, you know, so the next sentence collides against that one, or, or you can, you know... You can say, I want, to look, I want to be at the threshold between sense and nonsense. Um, I have a really wonderful example of writing from a prose poem by Ben Marcus, which I use in that, in that case, which is a, it's a one paragraph piece, but it's a very, very spatial piece of writing in which everything seems to be frozen. It's like a sort of, it's like a tableau, you know, a, the panorama, when it, all these things, dramatic things are happen, happening, but it's also very difficult to see the scale and the perspective. It's like they're happening superimposed on each other, and at the same time, they're frozen in time. It's hard to, it's hard to describe it without looking at it, which we could do if you want. <laughs> um, but um, it, what's interesting with a, pass, a piece of writing like that is if you give it to architects and say, 
what would this be if it's a model, you know? You see how people interpret it. And I've had people creating architectural models out of a text like that. Um, if you give it to other practitioners, you know, I've seen people also make, make a film out of it, which is not a literal film of it, but a, an interpretation. Of, and if you give it to musicians and say, this is a notation system, and then people think of it in terms of time rather than space, you know, so they're looking at the sequences and, and how they might interpret that in terms of tones and discords and, you know, harmonies and so on. So, um, in a sense, I mean, I guess what I, one of the things that interests me is ideas of literacy as well, because I've been in, you know, lots of crits over the year, of the years, and from everything from, you know, architecture, ceramics and glass, craft, textiles, fine arts, uh, the performing arts, etc., etc. And of course, to fully appreciate something, you need to be also trained in that discipline to fully understand all its nuances. At the same time, it interests me in that it's possible to really identify the qualities of a work and also have a, a good conversation about it, which the which the presenter feels is beneficial. And somehow that communicates across backgrounds, across across disciplines. So in other words, there's a type of literacy which maybe it's a uh, maybe it's the art of seeing connections, or maybe it's the ethics of playing close, paying close attention to a work, which I do think is an ethical issue. You know that you give it your total, undivided attention, that allows the work to speak, that draws out its qualities. You know, um, and I'm sort of interested in that in a way, a post-disciplinary way of thinking, because then it's a sort of, maybe literacy is the wrong, wrong word for it, but it's um, engagement is perhaps a better word. It's an engagement which um, overflows sort of specialized languages. Um, and it may be that, you know, in my case, from spending my formative years, uh, spending a lot of time with close reading on things like, you know, poetry or medieval lyric poetry or, concrete poetry it was really difficult stuff that that it's like going to the gym you know that you you work on this habit of close reading and you can then transfer that into other activities and say ah oh, these are possible interpretations of this work but probably you've all had the experience where you know you presented a work and a critic has come along and said ah oh, it's about this or you should have done that and you think hang on a sec, you are not speaking from where I am listening, you know. <laughs> I wanted to have a conversation here, and you've just projected onto my work your own agenda, you know, and they don't connect. It's not interesting for me to just hear your, your um, ready-made speech applied to my work because you're not engaging with my work. So the challenge always is to create that protocol where you actually meet, um, in, or put it another way, the point of this course, I would think, one of the points of this course, I would think, is that it will give you the capacity to design the appropriate form of conversation that you want to have around your work. So we were just talking about this over lunch as well. And um, sort of, I was reflecting on, I've been at so many crits where a student stands up and says, okay, uh, hi, my name is Rolf Hughes. I'm interested, uh, so this is my project. And uh, okay, right, um, I'm interested in so I started off, and then I discovered, and then I came across this person, or this method, or this thinker, or this practitioner. And so I took this detour, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. And it's like a narrative, or you know, sometimes jokes, sometimes it's a, a narrative of the ruins of a once optimistic desire. You know? <laughs> I, I started there, but I ended up compromising, and I ended up doing this. It's one way of doing things. It's maybe not the best way of doing things. Uh, you may feel that you're being honest. It's like a diary. You know, it's like reading a diary almost. <laughs> you may feel that you're being honest and showing integrity and wanting to share and so on. But it's a device. That speech is not. It's got nothing to do with honesty. It's it's just a device. And I would say it's not usually or often. It's not a particularly good device. But you can instead you can start at the end or you could start. In, in the middle of the process, or you could start the question. Or, and if you think instead of that, what you're doing in that type of uh, performance called a present, project presentation, what you're doing is you're creating structures of attention. 
You know, so you're saying to your audience, who let's believe and hope is goodwilled. You know, they, they come with goodwill. They want to understand your work. They want to help you to, you know, to uh, empower you and your work. So they have good intentions. So your task is then to direct their attention. You know, look at this, <laughs> now look at that, or spend this long at that, and now look at this. And you can think of other analogies to that, like guiding somebody through an art gallery if they've only got, you know, 20 minutes. You say, right, we're going to look at this piece, and then we're going to look at that one, that one, that one. And uh, it's not everything I know, but I'm designing the structure of attention that will allow you to have, in my, in my view, the best possible experience within those constraints. Are we... part of this thing being about creating, I don't mean, quite how you put it, the right kind of conversation around the work is mm. very much spot on. And the many possibilities of doing that, the many forms it can be done in, mm. is what we're trying to explore. I think it's fantastic. This course is really a great, um, a great initiative. And I think it will, um, it will actually empower you, not only during your undergraduate degree, but beyond that, both for those that go into practice and also for those that want to stay or that want to return at a certain point to second or third cycle education, like a master's or a PhD, it would really be a central, what you learn in this course and what you experiment with in this course, I think would really be very central in all those, all those areas. And also, you know, what do architects do? A large part of what they do is set up those type of encounters. You know, here's the project proposal. And that's all about staging how you stage it to your clients, stakeholders, etc. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Really Pleasure to be here. Mm.